Here's what's coming up on Network Africa. Truce in Sudan appears to hold despite early breaches of the deal. Liberian authorities launch manhunt for four suspects who disappeared in a drug trial. And authorities in Mozambican capital Maputo restrict beach access amid crime. Welcome to the program. I'm Millicent Walker in Lagos. We begin with what appears to be Sudan's latest ceasefire now uh, holding, and despite early breaches of the deal. It's the first truce to have been formally agreed and signed by both sides, but there were reports of airstrikes and clashes in the capital, Khartoum, as it came into force yesterday. In the cities of Omdurman and Bahari, uh, which adjourned the capital, people said they had heard gunfire. The ceasefire will enable the delivery of badly needed humanitarian aid. Hours before the latest truce was due to begin, the head of the paramilitary, uh, the RSF, uh, General Hamdan Dagalo, issued a belligerent statement urging his troops to defeat the National Army and win the war. United Nations envoy to Sudan, Volker Pert, said the monitoring mechanism established for Sudan under a Saudi and U.S. brokered deal contemplates publicly attributing violations to the ceasefire. Mr. Pert said fighting in the 48 hours uh, prior to the ceasefire taking effect has already violated one of the agreements under the deal. Hours before a week-long ceasefire aimed at allowing delivery of aid was due to take effect, Sudan's army conducted airstrikes in the capital. Cartoon. Monetary mechanism has been established which will make it possible to say and if need be also say publicly where and when and by whom the ceasefire was violated if it is violated. Um, both parties had committed not to seek military advantage in the 48 hours preceding it. That has not been honored. We have seen fighting also yesterday and today. Well, before people quote you and say that it was me saying that, no, I did not speak about an ethnicization of the regional dimension. I, I did speak about the risk indeed of the conflict getting tribal, ethnic, or ideological undertones or dimensions inside Sudan. Let me be very clear here. This struggle, this war, is not a civil war. It is a war between two military formations, between two armies, Sudanese armed forces and the rapid support forces. Meanwhile, Volker Pers also warned of the growing ethnicization of the military conflict that broke out in Sudan last month and the potential impact on neighboring states. Addressing the Security Council, he noted that preventing the escalation or ethnicization of the conflict was among the UN's top priorities. According to the World Health Organization, more than 700 people have been killed and at least 5,287 have been injured, though the true death toll is believed to be much higher. According to estimates of the Doctors' Union, more than 860 civilians have been killed, including more than 190 children, with another 3,500 civilians injured. Many are missing. Over a million have been displaced. More than 840,000 have sought shelter in safer parts of the country, while another 250,000 or so 
have crossed Sudanese borders. Reports of rampant looting, of intimidation, harassment, and enforced disappearance are deeply concerning. UN premises and residences, including the UNITAMS compound, as well as large amounts of food and humanitarian supplies, have also been looted. Criminality is compounded by the release of thousands of prisoners and the increasing spread of small arms. Besides the people of Sudan, Your Excellencies, neighboring countries are also feeling the burden of the war as they are hosting thousands of refugees. And these are countries who are either emerging out of the conflict or are facing serious economic and humanitarian crisis by themselves. For instance, the Republic of South Sudan, which has closed economic and social ties with the, Sudan, with the Republic of Sudan, has been impacted by the conflict as the price of goods has spiked. And the purchasing power of the South Sudanese pound has weakened since the conflict broken out in the Republic of Sudan. Well, more from the United Nations is that figures estimate shows more than 66,000 Syrians ended up in Sudan after their homeland was torn apart by the conflict since 2011. Many now seek to join the flood of foreigners who have left Sudan in past days, including in evacuations organized by their government. Fearing a return to their shattered homeland, some Syrians are now stranded between two conflicts. Major warfare in Syria has mostly stopped though the country is still divided between government, rebel and Kurdish controlled zones. The director, Mohamed Kodofani, has described his presence at the Cannes Film Festival as bittersweet. He directed the first Sudanese film to be included in the festival's official selection as weeks of fighting in Sudan has driven nearly 1.1 million people from their homes. His film, Goodbye Julia, looks at the effect South Sudan's split from Sudan in 2011 has had on people's life. Undermined by racism, war and political instability, relations between the two countries remain tense to this day. Mr. Kodofani said he hoped Sudan could find peace and reconciliation in the future. Well, for more on the latest in Sudan, VOA's Africa correspondent Mariama Diallo joins me now for more. Hi, Mariama. What's the update on ground in Sudan as we speak? Well, hello, uh, and thanks for having me, uh, uh, obviously, today. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the hopes, uh, basically, was that uh, this latest uh, ceasefire, this latest uh, agreement was going to be the one that works. And I think in the early hours, uh, calm was reported in certain parts of Sudan, but then that very quickly changed to basically what has been happening in the past uh, month since the war started. So I think it's on and off at this point. We uh, being just the beginning, uh, the first or the second day since the ceasefire agreements have taken effect, I think we, things are going to change here and there, and uh, we will uh, basically see what happens as the day goes, um, as the week goes. But I have to say that. Uh, you know, the, 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 this latest agreement uh, was uh, the, the result of, of intense uh, uh, negotiation, uh, intense diplomacy, and I'm quoting uh, basically the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken uh, today, who said that uh, basically, uh, you know, while the U.S. and, uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia helped basically broker uh, the latest agreement, uh, that it was up to the warring parties, it was up to the two generals to basically implement it. And I think he threatened sanctions at this point, saying that, uh, and I'll quote here, if the ceasefire is violated, we will know. And uh, basically, we will hold the violators accountable uh, through our sanctions and other tools at our disposal. And, and Mariam, uh, I mean, a lot of people are wondering um, if indeed, you know, the ceasefire will hold, even though there are these sanctions, uh, just a bit of what you've read out as well. Um, but more importantly is, you know, many wonder, is this really a, a battle of, of egos or, or, or something else um, because of the clashes that has been on uh, for many weeks? We heard from uh, Kenya last week who said that they needed to stop the nonsense. So um, when they go for these meetings and, you know, 
know, ceasefire, one wonders, you know, what are really the issues and why can they come to some sort uh, of agreement? Well, I think at this point, it's, it, it probably goes beyond egos or beyond just like, uh, I, I think the reports have been that uh, each one of the factions is trying to, to have hold on power. I mean, we, uh, it's hard to, 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 to imagine that, uh, to forget that these two uh, generals were uh, uh, together. They helped topple that longtime uh, uh, leader of, uh, of, of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir. Uh, and even, uh, you know, during, uh, uh, during the, the period of trying to transition uh, the country into civilian rule, uh, they banded together. And, uh, it, you know, uh, General Burhan was number one and uh, Hamedji uh, was number two. So uh, I think at this point, uh, with the entire world uh, talking to them and negotiations, I mean, the past negotiations, uh, I mean, seemed like it was going to be the one that works. And um, I mean, I guess maybe giving it a few days to see if something is going to stick. Uh, but at this point, it's hard to, to know what the reasons are, the reasons we knew in the beginning, you know, trying to transition to, into civilian rule and integrating the RSF forces into the Sudanese army. Uh, but a month and, and, and a week later, uh, not being able to, to broker a, a basic uh, thing that would be a ceasefire. And I guess that also just shows the lack of, of trust between the two parties. And I think I spoke to analysts who also mentioned that it's possible that there are other facts that maybe these two generals don't have complete control of the people who are fighting for them. So it's hard for them to basically say, okay, we can have a ceasefire, we agree on a ceasefire, we sign it. Uh, but then what the, the, the different factions, the different militias that support the two generals are doing, maybe they don't have control over that. And in your opinion, um, what country do you think um, can stand as a mediator? I know the U.S. has really uh, been instrumental here, um, but perhaps in Africa um, that, you know, can, can assist? Well, I think that's a, that, that's a very good question because I think at this point uh, many have tried. And when, uh, when I say many, uh, you know, you see it, you know, for, for, from, from all sides. And again, from the United Nations to the Arab League, which, you know, with Saudi Arabia on this one, Egypt. Uh, you've also, you know, had, uh, you know, the African Union, obviously, and you've had the EGA countries. And one of the experts I interviewed today, uh, you know, even if they, they it, it, it's it's uh, the, the latest negotiations are louder, absolutely. I mean, it's important they, they did a, an amazing uh, job to come up with some kind of agreement. Uh, maybe it's time to give to, to, to also give a chance to maybe the EGA countries because that's how it started in the beginning. It was like uh, three uh, three countries, uh, including Kenya, I think Djibouti, and uh, and South Sudan. Uh, were delegated to mediate this crisis, and then all of a sudden it, it changed uh, to, to Saudi Arabia and the United States. I think at this point, obviously, the inter some other people are also thinking that there is not, uh, it's, it's not organized, basically. Everybody is just doing this, doing that, and doing that. So maybe have a more concerted effort uh, of, of like, you know, who's going, and the other, <laughs> Before I forget, this part is also, the, it's a part that we are not talking about a lot. What about the civil society? I mean, those people were the ones, the people of Sudan were the ones who, who basically protested for weeks and months and months and months and got rid of their, the, 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 the former leader. So they have to be brought onto the table and maybe their voices uh, can make a difference. But at this point, I think what, the international community is trying to do, and 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 including everybody, is is probably just to to secure a ceasefire, and then everything else will fall. But definitely, the analysts that I talked to today talked about uh, the EGAD block and tried to see if there is an you know like an African solution. Uh, to this crisis. To the problem. Also, talking about the people, many figures are coming out from the United Nations, those that are fleeing Khartoum and those that are uh, perhaps going to, to neighboring countries. Do we know the impact, uh, the humanitarian situation uh, for those in the capital where uh, this is happening? 
I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you look at, uh, you know, all the countries that border uh, Sudan, and a lot of them, uh, I think Chad has been uh, basically taking the, the, the big brunt. Uh, you have South Sudan, you have Ethiopia, uh, CAR on the other side. And I think I was just watching something that one of our correspondents, actually, a, a piece that he did on, uh, on, on some Sudanese refugees uh, in Chad on the border, uh, which is, uh, which has been very serious because of the, the issue in, in, in western Darfur, uh, in Janaina, which is also uh, another part that a lot of people are not talking about, but, but the violence and, and fighting has been very intense. Uh, I think there are reports of about 100,000 people who are displaced. I think what touched me from that report in Chad was this young gentleman who's 18 and who basically his dream of going to college is basically gone. He said that his parents basically were visiting Khartoum to get some medical help and that he ended up having to flee uh, with his siblings. So right now he's basically in the Tadian border uh, caring for his siblings. And, uh, and that's just one story. I mean, there are millions of thousands of other stories like that. Um, so I think on the refugee side, they're, they're feeling it, but on the country who are the countries that are also welcoming the refugees, I, I can only imagine, uh, you know, what they're going through and the lack of capacity in, in a lot of these, these countries, um, you know, and even if you have capacity, all of a sudden when you have an influx of thousands and thousands of refugees, it has to have an impact uh, on the country. You know? yeah. You're right, Mariam. And we do hope that from the ceasefire, they can proceed to something uh, more peaceful for the nation. We'd like to thank you, uh, Mariam, as VOA's Africa correspondent joining me from Nairobi. Thanks again. Thank you for having me. Welcome back to the program. The U.S. State Department says Russian mercenary force Wagner Group is trying to obscure its efforts to acquire military equipment for use in Ukraine. U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller said that Washington has been informed that Wagner is seeking to transit material acquisitions to aid Russia in the war through Mali. For being a few minutes late. <coughs> Else. Yeah, what I'll say is we do believe that uh, Wagner is we do believe that uh, Wagner is trying to obscure its efforts to acquire military equipment for use in Ukraine, including by working through third country third party countries where it has a foothold. We have been informed that Wagner is seeking to transit material acquisitions to aid Russia's war through Mali and is willing to use false paperwork for these transactions. In fact, there are indications that Wagner has been attempting to purchase military systems from foreign suppliers and route these weapons through Mali as a third party. Uh, we have not seen as of yet that in, any indications that these acquisitions have been finalized or executed, but we are monitoring the situation closely. We have sanctioned a number of entities and individuals across multiple continents that support Wagner's military operations, and we will have more to share on this, uh, this question soon. Kenyan police says they are hunting for the former leader of the outlawed Mungiki gang, Mainan Jagger, and seizing, or rather after seizing, two firearms and cannabis from a home linked to him in western Nakuru County. The Directorate of Criminal Investigation said in a statement that the items were recovered following a raid mounted by detectives in Ngomongo village last week, and eight suspected members of an organized criminal gang were arrested. According to authorities, Mr. Jenga had was summoned to appear at police headquarters in Nakuru, but failed to do so and instead went into hiding. The Mungiki is a secret uh, sect that was banned in 2002 after being accused of being involved in violence and organized crime. 
Authorities in the Mozambican capital, Maputo, have said all beaches in the city will be closed between 1900 and 05 uh, a.m. local time in order to combat crime, increasing acts on violence, including rapes, murder, especially at night and often on beaches, have prompted the measure. The municipal director of tourism, Matsumane, said that permission would have to be obtained before anyone could hold activities on the beachfront uh, during the evening. He adds that the Costa del Sol beach, a popular venue for parties and sporting activities, will have a dedicated police post to ensure that people comply with the order. Over in Liberia, where authorities say they've lost all trace of four suspected drug dealers linked to a $100 million cocaine shipment after a trial jury unexpectedly acquitted them. Last year, with assistance from the uh, U.S. and Brazil Liberian security officials, they seized a container with more than 500 kilos of cocaine inside. Four men from Liberia, Portugal, Lebanon and Guinea-Bissau were arrested in what was seen at the time as one of Liberia's biggest biggest successes against drug smugglers. But last week, a jury in the capital, Monrovia, found them not guilty. The justice minister condemned the decision, saying it had brought international ridicule on Liberia. He vowed to rearrest them, but they have since fled. However, Liberian authorities have launched a manhunt for the suspects. And we're now in South Africa, where citizens blame their local government for failing to provide clean water as deaths from cholera rose to 15 in the country's most populous province. The health department in Gauteng, uh, Gauteng province declared a cholera outbreak over the weekend in Hammanskral, an area about 50 kilometers northwest or the capital, Pretoria. The city government said almost 100 people have been seen at hospital and 37 have been admitted to wards, warning residents in surrounding areas not to drink tap water. We could be able to report that all these deaths that we are reporting uh, as cholera related have taken place in the, in the hospital. So which actually says to us, could there be another, any other deaths that are taking place outside there that we are not aware of, including those eight that have happened in the free state that we are not putting as our statistics because we have not confirmed that uh, through stool specimens that those were part of a, a cholera outbreak. The issue of water in Tuane has been a problem for a number of years. And um, there have been problems politically, problems politically that that municipality over time there have been issues of uh, uh, conflicts in such a way that the citizens were exposed, became vulnerable. And uh, mm -hmm. even now, you know that there is issues of uh, a coalition government, a very, very uh, kind of a new feature in South Africa, very unstable. And finally on the program, a Ghanaian peacekeeper serving in the disputed Sudan, South Sudan border region of Abeyi has won a United Nations award for championing the rights of women. 32-year-old Captain Cecilia Erzura will receive the 2022 UN Military Gender Advocate of the Year Award from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres this Thursday. Captain Erzura has served in Abeyi since March 2022 as the commander of the Ghana Engagement Platoon. Ghana is currently the largest contributor of women peacekeepers in the United Nations, with 375 now deployed. Congratulations to her and to women around the world. That's our program. Thank you for watching. I'm Millicent Walker.